You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Your home is likely filled with objects that can connect to the internet, like your computer or cell phone, but also probably your TV, maybe even your refrigerator or thermostat. More and more, we've become attached to an internet of things. Each of those represents a way for a hacker to get into your system. For municipalities, building a secure and resilient IT network involves covering all bases, from work from home computers to the infrastructure in town halls. Joining us today are Brian Scoera, Middletown Director of Information Systems, Francisco Palacio, President of Digital Back Office, and Dale Bruckhart of DBO to talk with municipal systems from the bottom up. We'd like to thank our premier sponsor at Digital Back Office, Palo Alto Networks. Check them out at digitalbackoffice.com or paloaltonetworks.com. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Congress of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or our member municipal leaders. Hey everybody, thanks for being here today. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Um, over the past 40 years or so, an IT department kind of went from being something that only large companies had a necessity for, for a business. Um, but now it's kind of gone to companies of all sizes and especially it's gone to municipalities. Um, can you talk us through the growth of how the use of computers has changed in uh, a municipal setting over the last few decades? Can you start with Brian? So the change in approach in technology and municipal government is the same as everywhere, which is we've gone from it being a rarefied commodity piece of equipment that only trained specialists can use to something as ubiquitous as having a water fountain or a tap. And just like water, it is now a utility that everyone expects to be able to access and use. Our coworkers, our colleagues outside of technology departments, they live and breathe with technology, even if they don't know everything that powers their television, their smartphones. So when they come into a workplace, they expect the same level of ease of access and functionality um, without necessarily thinking about the structures behind it. So, you know, by replacing typewriters, phones, um, you know, environmental controls, uh, file cabinets with massive pieces of electronics, um, we, we've created a wonderful means to make government easier to access for the public, easier to execute for employees, but a little bit more logistically uh, difficult mm. to maintain and keep safe from those who would do us harm. What's your take on, on where kind of the technology has gone over the last few decades? Well, over the last, last few decades, the uh, necessity for higher and higher security to yeah. keep uh, people connected is getting more and more important to the point that it's like what Brian said, they expect no interruption, especially if in this dispersed environment where you have all this, like us connecting from different places. If the connectivity gets lost, we lose quite a bit of effectiveness during that time. Yeah, it's no longer just, you know, checking your email or your Facebook, this is right now, I, I am working with, with all of you as I'm sure you are right now on the clock. And we need this connection to do, do our jobs on a daily basis right now. Um, so now, as you said, it's kind of gone from a, a sort of rarefied thing that only certain people use. And now almost all employees have a personal computer or workstation in the office. And that's kind of the first line of defense in lies where kind of good security begins. What are some of the sort of training things you do and tactics that you pass on to municipal employees to help them avoid things like phishing attacks, malware, so on on their computers? Well, the, the first line of defense in most organizations are going to be your personnel. Um, they're oftentimes the most exploitable, the most vulnerable, but they're also the strongest asset in detecting and preventing intrusions and malicious actors from gaining access into our systems. Mm -hmm. Um, training doesn't have to be onerous. It does not have to be, you know, five to 10 hours a month. There are wonderful offerings uh, from a number of reputable companies 
that can provide you online interactive training with assessments. So in Middletown, Connecticut, we offer all new employees kind of an hour of training that they're expected to complete shortly after joining the city. Um, we do, after that, fairly random but consistent fishing assessment tests and then yearly refreshers for all employees. Um, if we identify ongoing problems, um, we ask people to take additional training. And we supplement this with you know, fairly regular updates about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. The most important thing for someone to understand is how their actions relate to a larger e ecology. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand how you as an employee and your behavior mirrors that in, of behavior of employees and companies that have been breached or government mm -hmm. agencies which have been encrypted and ransomed, then it, it doesn't hit home for you. So we try to always say, this is what's going on in the world. And this is why it's important that you know this. Yeah. And it's also kind of our responsibility to make sure our, our employees and our colleagues in the community understand that these are not just workplace concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we have as consumers technology that is open and accessible in our households that provide unprecedented access to those who might want to manipulate that data. We have businesses that make up core parts of our community that if, if they were ever truly attacked, uh, the ripple effects would be terrible. So these lessons don't just apply for employees. They apply to every aspect of modern life because it is a utility now that everyone has access to. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting what you said that for all the, the technology and kind of software you can put there, the best line of defense is for the employees themselves to have a good sense of what's safe, what's not, and to, to kind of follow those protocols. Uh, Dale, do you think that what they're doing um, is kind of how a lot of towns are operating with, with the training, or do you think, you know, Brian's kind of on the leading edge of some of that? Well, I, I would kind of like to ask uh, Brian, uh, the challenge that we see is, uh, as vendors of IT services, particularly to the municipal sector, is that the uh, selling this concept and, and most importantly making the case for the budgets that are required uh, and the funding that's required for a lot of this new technology how do you uh, how do you convince the various boards and uh, administrators and government officials that you have to deal with to get to the funding how do you convince them that, that this is important that they need to fund it hmm. From um, be it training to technology, the approach is generally the same. And I'd like to start off that no one gets anything without asking. Um, so you have to be ready to have the conversation with the folks who set the budgets, the stakeholders, the people who pay the taxes, that this is why it's important. So step one, make sure you understand why you're asking for something. Um, when we talk about, say, training or new firewalls or uh, endpoint protection, there's a lot of ways we can approach this. One is look at risk management. What is it going to cost when uh, an exposed community that has not taken steps to replace outdated technology that is vulnerable, when they're compromised, what is the remediation going to look like? And these are not numbers you, you have to make up. These are numbers that you can research yeah. because this, our this peers- This has happened to other cities where they've been exactly. hacked and it's cost them millions of dollars to fix. Yep, the, there's, our, our large communities in the United States from Atlanta to San Francisco have had you know, terrible incidents that have infected public health and public trust in the public institutions. So in addition to just the repair costs, the remediation costs, the cost to careers, the cost to the public trust, that's, that's incalculable. And then when you, you look at what does it actually cost to start implementing best practices, it's not an unreasonable amount, especially given that there's so many organizations that are there to render aid and guidance um, at little to no cost. Um, we start with, for instance, CIS controls, which are series of 20 steps that any institution can start looking at to improve their security posture. And those steps are best practices 
that suggest opportunities to work with vendors and to look at solutions. You know, from understanding what hardware is in your network, to understanding who has access to what, to starting to log and audit and continually assess vulnerabilities. You look at what your goal is, you look at what one of the controls you're trying to meet is going to be, and then you work with the people you trust to develop common sense approaches to meet them. Yeah, I would just like to add that Brian has implemented a platform that can actually be uh, leveraged or, or used very well mm -hmm. to practically minimize remediation, the necessity of remediation, because the platform can actually, through AI and machine learning, prevent the damage before they happen. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, and, and Brian already has that platform and it's really a good basis for making sure that bad things don't happen, yeah. that you don't have to remediate. Because when you get to the remediation step, it's too expensive at that point. You have gotten mm -hmm. too much damage and you get too many people to, uh, to get involved and it takes time. What you need to do is, as Brian has started, is to have a platform that actually would prevent mm -hmm. the damage from happening. And it is there. The technology has gotten to the point that the AI and machine learning capabilities will actually prevent, and we've seen it in action, will actually prevent the damage. That's really interesting. Brian, so I know we talked about how like the first line is training these people, and then we talked about the, the bad side is the remediation. But what we're mm -hmm. talking about here is the in-between, which is a lot of where kind of uh, digital back office and you kind of come in as the someone clicked on something they shouldn't have, something started to get in, but you're what you're talking about now is the stuff that catches it before it becomes a big problem, right? Yeah, so we have, um, I think we still call it sometimes next gen endpoint mm -hmm. uh, protection, but in a lot of ways, the adaptive technologies that are coming out that mm -hmm. are powered by AI are, are almost irregular. Like everyone has them now or should be investing in them. Um, what's amazing um, about programs, and the one we use is, is Cortex XDR, it's a very solid platform, um, is that the cost to implement when you compare it uh, against more traditional endpoint protections is not unreasonable. Um, in, I think more and more folks who are willing to do the legwork and look into the cost of many of these solutions are finding that they're not that expensive and the amount of protection you get from them is well worth the investment compared to remediation. Um, being able to not only have software that is constantly checking file behaviors. So what we're talking about is uh, moving away as many software packages have from signature based. They no longer care what the file looks like. They care what the file is doing when you execute it. Mm. They care about what is you know, the state of your memory and processor as you're executing normal behaviors? Is this unusual? Should this be happening? These are questions that are being evaluated by the software um, rather than just checking a static list of signatures. That, that's and interesting. Rather than just checking it at the door against a list of like, oh, bad, you stay out. It's once something comes in, whatever it says it is on the way in, the way it behaves, what's in the system is what it's really looking for now. Yep, instead of the bouncer just checking ID once you enter the nightclub, it actually gives you a person who follows you around to see what you're doing and make sure that you're staying in the areas that you're supposed to stay. And boots uh, so, you out if you're not. Yes. So and it's behaving properly if you if you're not. And you know, this is each one of the that's a, a component, because now that is an endpoint protection, but having that information roll up to a central dashboard. So that way, no matter where you are, you can access this information on like a cloud platform, at least a centralized platform. So mm -hmm. you can see how did this happen on one computer? Because it's never just one endpoint. It's always a pattern. There was yeah. an entry point into your network. There was an infection or there was a manipulation that was unauthorized. And how does this track? Yeah. Being able to look at the signifiers and being able to gather actionable intelligence so you can share with partners um, and find the assistance you need to remediate and to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, and this has to tie into 
you know, you go, you start with, uh, you know, training, you have the endpoint protection. You also have to have your edge network protection, your core network protections, your security appliances that are either monitoring or reporting on the data that's coming in and out of your network. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the programs that run on a computer that you have to worry about their behavior. You have to worry about every piece of data that's coming in or out of your network. And that does require modern equipment. There's, and that's a, one of the justifications that um, you can use mm -hmm. when you're talking about the need for investment is to pull, regardless of what you have for existing firewalls, mm -hmm. just demonstrate as a municipality in Connecticut, how many international attempts to access your data you can see. Yeah, because this isn't theoretical that we're talking about here that someday you might get attacked. This is happening on a daily basis, more or less, right? We see oh, yeah, little it, pokes and tests are always popping up warnings, right? Yeah, we see it every day when you look at the, uh, what, like Brian's firewall, if he, if he looks at it, you know, attempts from Bulgaria, Romania, China. Yeah. So those are the things that we see are getting actually blocked. But what's good about what I was saying is that Brian has already the basis of a platform that actually understands and, and, and that platform can actually predict some impending, a source of an impending attack because everything is getting massaged and uh, you know, AI and machine learning processed in the cloud and say, wait a minute, there's a combination of actions that are happening inside and outside and on the endpoint and I think that's an impending uh, attack happening. Mm -hmm. this. That's interesting. So it's not even just necessarily it's picking up one sort of thing that, that some of these programs are doing. It's maybe doing something over this part of the system and over here. And you see that in combination and you know. Yeah. That and, that's what, okay. and that's what the machine and the, and the, and the actions on the uh, data constantly are. It's being processed constantly in, in the cloud, the mm -hmm. intelligence cloud, so that things that may not be easily identifiable, when you put them all together, mm -hmm. gives you a, a picture comes up and says, I don't like this picture. It's basically what it's... Uh, what, what <laughs> Something uh, doesn't look quite right here. Doesn't look quite right here because the combination yeah. of all the different sources comes up with a picture you don't like. Yeah, um, so obviously you're all very familiar with all this kind of tech stuff. Um, but for everybody at home, just quickly, could one of you maybe walk us through kind of the differences, differences between malware, uh, ransomware, and phishing? Sure. So phishing is not even a technological thing. Phishing is an old school con artist. Phishing okay. is the man who wants to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge for the fifth time today. Okay. Fishing it's, is social it's a Nigerian instrument. prince who's got a, a great deal for you. Okay. Yeah. It is a phishing is a social engineering attempt whereby someone pretends to be someone they're not or sends you something that pretends to be um, legitimate when it's not mm -hmm. to either ex uh, trick you into providing your username or password or to violate security protocols um, to transfer funds. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, and I want to emphasize this, that phishing is ultimately not a technology, it's not a technical attack, it's mm. social engineering, which is why for everything we do on the endpoint protection, for every email protection we mm. put on, until folks are confident enough in their own ability to distinguish between truth and lies, mm. there's always going to be a problem because we can't stop English language transmitting, just saying, I'm someone who I'm not. Yeah. That's a phishing attack. Um, now, malware is effectively any, any piece of software which is going to do harm. Mm -hmm. It's just bad software. Okay. Perhaps it exists to steal data. Perhaps mm -hmm. it exists to um, you know, extract credentials. Some of them sit and give remote control to your systems to third parties. Um, one type of malware that we're all very afraid of is the ransomware, which encrypts your data so you cannot access it. Um, and usually your, your criminal attacker, because they are criminals, um, they will extort money from you to 
potentially unlock it. They can't always have that ability. Sometimes they just tell you they can, but then you will have lost your data. Uh, ransomware has gotten a layer of complication in the last 12 months. Uh, many of the criminal organizations responsible for encrypting data have now combined um, that sucker punch of encrypting your data with stealing your data and then demanding that not only must you pay to unencrypt and restore your data, you must pay to make sure they don't leak your data. Mm. Um, so it, it is troublesome. Now, thankfully, there are a lot of protections you can take. Um, you know, endpoint protection, the systems we were talking about earlier with Francis, many of them can observe and stop that encryption from happening. Mm. There's, there's always new exploits. There's always new ways to get around these very powerful um, protections. But at least we have some level of protection if you configure them correctly, if you understand the behaviors you're trying to prevent. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. How quickly is kind of the turnover the stuff? Like the, the technology that you're using right now, how, how long has it been sort of, you're saying it's no longer the next generation, sort of this generation standard. How long have we been kind of using this sort of stuff? I think Francis and Dale have a better grasp, but I've been hearing about um, these technologies for at least four to five years. Um, and what's nice is that it's no longer just one or two vendors. Hmm. Um, the, the market has gotten um, a number of options, many of whom are using some impressive like corporate backers and some of the people who have been working the hardest to implement AI um, across all aspects of technology. But I think Francis and Dale have a better grasp of the history of it. Yeah, Francis, Dale can talk us through kind of how, how quickly this stuff moves, moves along. Well, what's good about the technology that Brian is using that, uh, is it grows and knows how the cybersecurity uh, is evolving mm. and because of its AI and machine learning capabilities, it adjusts automatically mm. based on the uh, situation, the cybersecurity situation that it sees out there. Uh, depending on whether you're a vendor or whether you're on the, uh, on the municipal side, uh, when there's a line item in a budget, oftentimes it can stay there uh, for many years. Mm. Uh, and getting back to Brian's point before about some of the aging technology, uh, I think that's you know what particularly the public sector and our K-12 schools are struggling with uh, is they have a lot of these older technologies in their budgets and the vendors are happy to you know renew these services year after year, but you know the vendors uh, are sometimes the victims of their own success. Uh, they might've been successful five, six, seven, eight years ago and they're still selling the same technology now that they sold five or six or seven years ago. So uh, it, it behooves your uh, municipal IT uh, uh, directors like Brian mm -hmm. to constantly be evaluating those line items in the budget, uh, not just for cybersecurity, but obviously for performance, for uh, productivity, for applications, uh, to make sure that uh, they're, not, uh, they're not stagnant. Yeah. So we've been talking so far kind of more about, you know, individuals uh, on their computers and how they can be safer and stuff. But um, how do you begin to build kind of larger networks of computers together in a secure way? Because I, I know that kind of increases, uh, what's the word, attack surface. Can you talk about the, uh, the attack surface and how do you minimize that? Um, I, I mentioned at the, the top of the interview and I'll say it again, the CIS controls uh, which uh, are an alternative and supplement to things like the NIST controls, okay. are a great step-by-step -step roadmap for people in all walks of technology to mm -hmm. review and follow. Um, some important aspects of that is understanding the function of every piece of technology that's connected to a network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at a low level, there's this concept of, you know, least privilege access. If you don't need administrative access 
to your local computer to do your job. You shouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. But that also applies to the pieces of technology. If this, say, phone, my smartphone, okay. I'd like to have it on a wireless network at work. Does it need access to the same wireless network or the same infrastructure that runs a financial system? No, mm -hmm. it does not. Um, do, does every piece of technology in my environment need unfettered access to the internet, let alone in from the internet? Probably not. Um, so understanding the function, having a control of your assets, and then making sure that each piece of equipment is segregated and has access only what it needs is important. Um, here's a, an example that uh, our friends at the Connecticut Education Network, CEN, uh, bring up a lot. It is very commonplace for us in IT to use something called network address translation to allow every piece of equipment in our environment to access the internet and, and have the access return the data come back. Oftentimes it is convenient to use a single point, single address for these translations. When we have access to sometimes dozens, depending on our, our agreements, mm -hmm. by actually splitting up how we send data out to the internet and how we allow it to come back, we actually help segregate and make mm -hmm. sure that if there's a compromise or an attack point over here, it doesn't affect everything. Mm -hmm. So in some respects, it's not about shrinking in a, the attack vector this way or shrinking our exposure space. It's making mm -hmm. sure that our exposure space isn't this deep. Mm -hmm. By keeping it shallow and wide, it's, it's a different way to approach it. It's not putting all your digital eggs in one basket. Correct. Um, so making sure that you also, there are wonderful tools to make sure that what you have exposed to the internet is secure. Um, so there are vulnerability scanning tools and our, our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security and um, this, oh my goodness, I have to remember what CISA stands for, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. They provide complementary vul complementary vulnerability scannings mm -hmm. Uh, for municipal agencies, actually for almost any organization, they will tell you on a weekly basis if you have something that is very bad, like um, an un like if you have open doors that anyone could walk in, they can't help you fix it, but they can at least tell you what you should be fixing. And this is and a, I'm sure a free service that's out there? These are free services. There are a, a laundry list of government agencies and nonprofits that have been established to help municipalities and public agencies become secure. Mm -hmm. um, and they can point you into the right direction so you can then work with your trusted providers to come up with solutions. So yeah. as an example of a vulnerability, let us say that in scanning, um, they have identified that you have an outdated Windows server. Mm -hmm. And the outdated Windows server is very vulnerable to things like Blue Keep and, and other truly terrible uh, attacks. You're now aware of it, but there's a good chance that because we do work for municipal agencies, that server that's exposed to the internet is very vulnerable, runs a mission critical piece of software that there's no replacement for at this time. Mm -hmm. So what's your next step? Your next step is if you can't fix the vulnerability, you have to come up with your risk mitigation strategies, which is why you want you know, not just endpoint protection, but security software and appliances yeah. that can help identify, you know, attempted exploits, just like your endpoint protection does it for, you know, your computer. Mm -hmm. There are network solutions that can do it as part of a firewall to help look at what's coming at that vulnerable service that can block those malware attacks, not even uh, from even entering your environment, let alone trying to execute. Yeah. And then you have to consider, well, can I segregate this very vulnerable thing from everything else in my network, even though it has to be available to the public? Mm -hmm. These are all questions you have to come up with answers for. But it starts with knowing that you have a problem and then determining what the best solution is. Yeah. I um, mentioned uh, best practices before, but uh, there's another aspect of it that 
certainly we as a as a internet service provider uh, in, increasingly have to produce uh, our audited reports on an annual basis uh, called SOC uh, SOC reports that uh, ensure that the best practices that we're supposed to be follow that we're supposed to follow are actually followed. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, uh, auditors are asking for those uh, reports. Uh, our customers are asking for those reports because their auditors are asking for those reports. And I, I believe that you know, increasingly we're going to see that in the uh, in the public sector as well, uh, where the audit uh, reports are going to become just a, a standard practice uh, every year, just like uh, any other kind of financial audit. And that's interesting. And speaking of audits, and this ties back into Dale's question, how do, we, how do we approach our elected officials with initiatives that may require funding? Mm -hmm. So I, I think many municipalities um, are aware of cyber liability insurance for the inevitable, when we get attacked, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And many times the liability insurance, you know, it also encompasses you know, remediation services, investigative services, forensic services. I think we're seeing a trend, however, that your insurance carrier for cyber liability is not going to issue a policy unless you have certain bare minimum technologies and best practices in place. Mm. As an example, it's, it's really only a matter of time before multi-factor authentication is requirement. Um, yeah. And if you don't have multi-factor authentication, you may not be able to get certain, if any, cyber liability policies. Yeah. Okay. You're, you said that pass the physical before it gets to the life insurance, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Good example. So usually, uh, you know, at least historically, these networks were put together in, you know, the office or in city hall. But the last year has seen so many people, you know, rather quickly having to move to working from home. How did that impact, you know, your municipality specifically, and then maybe um, to Dale and Francis kind of municipalities in general, how, how have you been dealing with the sudden need for so many people to work from home? I am very, very grateful for having a hardworking team um, that is able to plan for the future. So, we did not have to invest in any specific new technologies to enable okay. us to have secure remote access. Um, we weren't able to translate every business process to a remote business process, mm -hmm. um, but we have a phone system that allows us to take calls and forward them to personal numbers or do effective presence from home. Mm -hmm. um, we have security appliances that allowed us to set up you know, secure client VPNs um, with dedicated monitored connections back to certain resources. Um, we had a standard for encrypted laptops that could be loaned out to city employees as needed. Um, and, you know, we have a remarkable fortune to be working with a number of talented partners and vendors mm -hmm. who were able to help us identify, um, you know, low cost or no cost solutions for either video conferencing slash web conferencing and, and other things that we needed that helped us transition. Um, but a lot of this was based on the fact that we've been building arguments for years about making sure that we were investing in robust redundant infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We plan for worst case scenarios because in technology, they always come true eventually. <laughs> um, so again, good fortune here. Um, and that we have a great team and that we work with people like Digital Back Office who can provide guidance when we need it. Yeah. Uh, Dale or Francis, um, has Middletown's experience with, with the pandemic sound kind of typical or how, are they better set than a lot of other towns have been to deal with this? I, I think they were better prepared uh, than some of our customers. Uh, uh, what, what I'm seeing out there with the big shift to the cloud uh, which had been going on long before the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but now the shift to the cloud in terms of working from home, uh, I think that uh, there's a real risk now that there's there's too much of uh, too much confidence in 
uh, whoever, whatever cloud service uh, people are using, that, uh, that, it's, that it is secure. Mm -hmm. uh, when in fact, uh, that's far from the case. Uh, you know, just uh, recently with the, uh, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, solar winds uh, breach, uh, it has come out that in fact, uh, Amazon Web Services had some, uh, as there were some risks uh, associated with this, uh, uh, with the solar winds that they've been reluctant to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about it either because they have more lawyers than we do. Uh, but uh, I think it, it it's a it it, it kind of emphasizes the fact that if you're using cloud services, you really need to pay attention more to uh, cybersecurity than perhaps. Uh, people have. And uh, Francis is uh, much more conversant in this from the technology than I am. So uh, maybe you want to chime in a little bit, Francis. <coughs> yeah, basically, uh, what, what uh, has been implemented in the cloud is an extension of what uh, has been implemented by Brian and in his environment. The same vendor has similar type, tight solutions in the cloud so that as you have firewalls in your on-premise uh, locations they have firewalls out in the cloud because these vendors these cloud vendors like aws and azure they will protect their environment but they will not protect your data mm. so you have to be still responsible to make sure that your data in the cloud is secure talk kind of at the beginning about how you got to train people and there's sort of the weak link in some ways is, you know, you can, you can put in this technology, but you know, the phishing is dependent on someone doing something that they're not supposed to. In IT though, it is also, you know, it's not just that technology, you are dealing with the people. Um, and like this last year with the working from home, there was things like right now we're, we're talking on Zoom and kind of early on in the pandemic, Zoom became very popular and kind of at the beginning there, there was some security stuff. So how do you, kind of one assess the new stuff as it's coming in and also how do you balance something like Zoom or Facebook or something that's kind of becomes ubiquitous that everyone knows how to use, they want to use, but there might be risks with it. How do you, how do you balance the popularity of something with the risks? So it is very difficult for any technology professional to stay abreast of every new trend and to conduct an exhaustive period of research themselves on say, what's the best way to use Zoom? Thankfully, we don't have to. Um, you know, there's organizations like the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, MSISAC, like mm -hmm. I said, the, the CISA. Um, there are Connecticut organizations like the Connecticut chapter of uh, GMIS, the Government Management Information Sciences um, Association, mm -hmm. where you know, we can aggregate these research projects. Um, you know, we can get best practices from the federal government because they're available. There are federal certification programs that will identify how to implement certain cloud platforms in a secure fashion. Mm. Um, CIS, the Center for Internet Security, which makes the CIS controls, mm -hmm. also comes up with common benchmarks and common settings for um, you know, servers and certain software packages that like th these are the security processes and policies and settings you should do for this. Mm -hmm. um, so relying on your professional organizations, your peers and your colleagues to help do the research, that's important. Now, when it comes to the policy, I can't speak for every other municipality, but you know, it always starts in Middletown with identifying an issue and then speaking to the executives, to the elected officials, and making sure they understand why we need a policy. You know, we, we are, in some ways, you know, I facilitate access to utilities. Um, and what I rely is on the people who are the leaders of the entire enterprise to be vested in the security and risk mitigation that's needed to protect us and our constituents. And they are, and it's a wonderful thing. But it goes back to what I talked about. You have to ask, as a technology professional, you have to be able to go, 
and speak to your leadership and say, this is important and this is why. Hmm. Facebook is very important. It is, you know, people use it to communicate with governments now. Yeah. Zoom and WebEx and all of these software packages are not only allowing conferences and calls like this, but it's what's allowing many agencies in Connecticut to be able to do the work of government to actually have committee meetings, council meetings, legislative meetings, to pass budgets. Yeah. So we need policies to protect this aspect of government, like we have policies that protect how we spend our money, how we make purchases, how we enforce zoning in our towns. It's no different. These yeah. are just what it takes. And I find that most employees, like when they understand why we're doing something, it's to protect our constituents, our data, our town, hmm. they get it. Everybody they get wants it. to do the right thing if, if yeah. they can. They just don't necessarily know all that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, there's a huge difference between saying, don't go on Facebook and no, you, you, you've been delegated to manage a city account. Of course you should be able to do this, but let's talk about the safe way to do it for yourself and for the constituents. Yeah. I, I would add to that, Brian, uh, the, the controls that you have in place now uh, with your next generation firewall allow you to block some components of a social media site like Facebook uh, because Facebook can be used to introduce malware into your network. So by identifying the components in a Facebook session that might be risky, it's mm -hmm. possible to just block those components of that Facebook session while allowing people to still freely use Facebook. And that's one of the, when we talk about Facebook, or we talk about people accessing like the Google suite in the cloud or Office 365 in the cloud, the challenge with cloud services is it's not just a website. It's not, you know, it is a bundle of application data that's coming down. Um, you know, if you can interact with some of these programs, they're not just static content. And you do need to be able to parse the individual streams and what's being done on the remote server and what's doing, uh, being done locally. Mm -hmm. And that is beyond the ability of any human being. You are going to rely on an intelligent device to be able to sort and identify. Even if it's legitimate traffic, you may not have a business need to allow it. Um, what do you see as the future of computing and information systems? Um, so many towns and cities are moving more and more and more things on their website, paying taxes, uh, meetings, you know, with the pandemic, so much has rapidly gone there. Um, but all the way to the things like body cam footage and all the other town files, what's the future of, of computing in the municipal setting and what's the future of security for that? Easy question. Well, so it's, this is where even when you, when you do have good justifications for your uh, budget requests, you kind of have the, the constraints. Ideally, over, ideally what I see is that any service that a city can offer, any public agency can offer, mm -hmm. should be offered online you should be able to do the business of government as a constituent from paying taxes to filing complaints to looking at data about your school systems to being able to request reports about what's happening um, with say repairs in your area to mm -hmm. public utilities and to roads and to sidewalks. This should be done online, it should be done through technology. We need to have an in-person component still. We're not, mm -hmm. We should not get rid of the traditional city hall or town offices because mm -hmm. we serve a huge cross-section of people from all walks of life. But the more we add technology as a mechanism for members of the public to apply for permits, mm -hmm. to be able to authorize work in their area, to provide feedback, the more we're giving our citizens the freedom not to be confined to like an eight to five window where they have to organize their life about a trip to city hall. Yeah. And these virtual meetings that have been enabled through the pandemic in Middletown, we've seen a tremendous spike in public attendance and participation in our public meetings. And yeah. that is so valuable. 
there are parents who previously couldn't find you know childcare at night and who couldn't commit to sitting in a, a public room for two to three hours to be heard on their concerns about their child's education mm. who are able to share that now. There are people without transportation, but who do have just a phone, not even a smartphone, a phone, who can be counted and heard yeah. uh, by decision makers. And technology is so empowering in that respect. Mm. How do we protect it? That is a great question. Yeah. Because the more we take these services out of a data center and into a cloud, the more we have to trust our partners. And Dale mentioned the SOC reports. Mm -hmm. This becomes an issue where you have to do your due diligence and you have to understand what data is being stored, how it's being stored, who's going to be able to access it, even though you don't have control over that server anymore. And that's why you need very intelligent controls in place. And you need to be aware of what your cloud service providers are using for their security processes. And just like we have to carry liability insurance for almost everything, we need to understand what they carry for liability insurance and what's the impact of them losing access to the data that our constituents put up there or it actually being stolen. Yeah. Understanding what that data is being used for, that's another issue. The other uh, change that we're going to see as a result of the pandemic is in, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, education, in our schools, in our K-12 mm -hmm. schools. They have been forced to confront uh, and, and adapt to remote education. For years, we've seen various attempts at uh, online education, video education, mm. but the pandemic has now changed the way educators think about delivering lesson plans, about delivering mm. uh, education. Uh, in a way that they've never had to deal with before. So yeah, working from home was already sort of a thing that people were starting to be more, become more comfortable with before right. this. But the everyone who going to school from home, that's that's new. That that has really uh, been forcing a a, a reevaluation, I think, of of how our educational services are delivered, and, and we'll continue to do so in the uh, in the near term. And well, it's just Dale brings up with the the, the remote schooling, and I kind of mentioned it about having to keep you know, physical town offices still accessible, mm -hmm. is that, you know, we, we must acknowledge that as we move to more technology, school, like at home learning, these online permitting and meeting systems, we can't raise the bar of entry so that our constituents can't access it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not everyone in our state has a computer. Not everyone in our state has a cell phone with unlimited data. Not everyone has access to reliable broadband. Yeah. So we need to be conscious when we're making these business decisions that we're not actually creating an even bigger divide, mm. that we're always expanding accessibility, enabling constituents to engage us, enabling learning, yeah. and yeah. not limiting it. Um, and sometimes that's well outside the bounds of, say, the technology department, but is very much the concern of elected leaders in our communities. Yeah. And we need to be ready to talk to them about these issues as well, about how initiatives could play out when we hit te technological disparities in our citizens. Well, Brian, Francis, Dale, thanks so much for speaking with us today. We'd like to thank our guests. I'd like to thank our premier sponsor, Digital Back Office Palo Alto Networks, which you can check out at digitalbackoffice.com and paloaltonetworks.com. Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Mayor Draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page.